So uh, Anne said that I'm going to talk about wolves today, and that is what I'm going to talk about, and Oregon's experience with wolf recovery and wolf management, uh, particularly since uh, the reintroduction of wolves to uh, the Yellowstone ecosystem and central Idaho in 1995 and 96. Um, it is actually something I've been working on for uh, quite a while. There is a, a, a project that I'm doing with some friends down at Oregon State University where we're putting together a, uh, a manuscript uh, on um, Oregon politics and policy, and uh, I'm doing uh, some work on that on biodiversity policy at the state level. And within that piece, I'm actually doing two case studies, and one is wolf recovery, and the other one is actually state forest policy. So if you really have to ask questions about state forest policy, we can maybe do that in the questions as well. And they are actually, as we might see here, a little bit interrelated. Um, and I think particularly as we move into maybe the next phase of wolf recovery in Oregon, we're going to see that relationship between wolf management and forest management maybe come to the fore in some really interesting ways, uh, and maybe even some positive ways. Uh, so it's something that um, is just going through the final edit, and it's going to come out in a book uh, published by Oregon State University Press next year, probably uh, I think we're looking at a May, June, May or June publication date. So. Um, but anyway, so this is, uh, I've just pulled out this stuff to talk about the uh, uh, wolves and Oregon wolf policy uh, from that piece. Uh, and uh, I'll hopefully uh, try to make it uh, somewhat entertaining. Um, I am a policy guy, um, uh, first and foremost by training uh, and by inclination. But for me, uh, when I think about public policy or environmental policy, policy particularly, it's really important for me to start looking at the science. Uh, and in order to start this lecture, I think it's really good for us to maybe look at and maybe appreciate some of the roles that uh, large predators like uh, uh, gray wolves um, um, play within a larger ecosystem. And thankfully, because of what happened in uh, the mid-1990s in Yellowstone National Park in central Idaho, as we have some really interesting research uh, regarding uh, the impact of wolves on a broader ecosystem. And we, uh, th th they are the quintessential example of what we call a keystone species. A keystone species we can also think of as almost being an ecosystem engineer. The way that they act on the landscape transforms the way that other species uh, respond to their presence and can actually transform the landscape itself. And um, I, I just have up here uh, uh, one example of this research on wolf uh, impacts done by some uh, colleagues down at Oregon State University, uh, Bill Ripple and uh, David Beshta. And, uh, Beshta particularly has, or Robert Beshta, Robert's been working on this uh, since the early 2000s, and this is actually some research that they published together in 2011 in geomorphology. And primarily, uh, you can see the title of it, it's the role of large predators in maintaining riparian plant communities and river morphology. And really what they were looking at is how the removal of wolves from the Yellowstone ecosystem first led to a, uh, a transformation of the riparian areas along streams. Essentially, they were denuded from vegetation because when the wolves were taken off the landscape, the undulate population, deer and elk, skyrocketed because they no longer had a, a large predator on the landscape. And deer and elk, are they like to browse. They like to browse on willows and other species, plant species, along riparian areas, along the streams. And so what we have here in their research is they actually do some um, um, time-lapse photography uh, or historical photography that they're able to put together from historical records. And you can see in the top here on the right, in uh, a 1924 picture of the Gallatin River, um, and you can see the dark areas there along the river are uh, willow and other types of vegetation along the riparian area. Really good. I mean, we know now that our 
uh, riparian ecosystems are healthier when they have a lot of vegetation. It keeps erosion from occurring. It actually uh, promotes the uh, presence of anadromous fish that are important for maybe humans and, and our economies. Uh, and also all sorts of other little critters that might be dependent upon that, that healthy vegetation along the stream banks. What we see in the middle picture here is um, a picture from 1961 of the same area. And if you notice, there is very, very little riparian vegetation. The willows are completely gone. Uh, and this is the result of not having any predators on the landscape. And so the deer and elk are just going at it. Right? Um, and then what we see here in the bottom picture is actually, um, uh, you, you, it's a little bit lighter than I would prefer, but it's the same stretch of river, and you can suddenly see here that the vegetation along the riverbanks has all come back. Right? And this uh, is a really good example of when you put these folks back on the landscape, how these folks respond in really interesting ways. And it falls into what we call within environmental science the trophic cascade model, right? That when we take one species off of the landscape, we see all these other interactions. It's the perfect example of what John Muir said, is when we, uh, when we tug on one thing in the universe, we find that it's hitched to everything else, right? One of the best um, quotes that I can use from John Muir with my students, right? You, you, you tug on one thing and you find it's hitched to everything else. Now, that's the science part, but we can also see this visually. There was a nice thing that was done by uh, 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 PBS a few years ago uh, following up on this research. And so I'm going to take a break and give you guys a break, and you can, can watch a video on this a little bit uh, set in Yellowstone. In 1995, something really exciting happened in the nation's first national park, Yellowstone. 41 wild wolves were reintroduced here by scientists. After 100 years of being hunted, wolves could once again call this place home. The wolves thrived, but something else very surprising happened. Their return had a spectacular effect on the landscape an effect that spread wider than anyone thought possible. So how did this all happen? In the past, wolves were seen as a risk to people and livestock, and they were exterminated from the Yellowstone area in the 1920s. The elk's main predator was gone, and their population more than doubled. Elk are both grazers and browsers, so they eat grass, shrubs, and trees. They overgraze the entire park, upsetting the natural balance of the ecosystem. Mammals like mice and rabbits could not use the plants to hide from predators, and their populations fell dramatically. Grizzly bears suffered as the elk munch away their berry supply, which they badly need to build up fat before hibernating. Pollinators like bees and hummingbirds had fewer flowers to feed on, songbirds less trees to nest in. Perhaps the elk's most devastating impact was how they affected the park's riverbanks. When the wolf was around, elk were vulnerable when they moved down towards rivers to drink. They would never spend too long by the water where they could be ambushed. But with the apex predators gone, they gorged themselves faster than the shrubs could grow and gathered in great herds on the lush river banks. The mass of elk's hooves eroded the river banks so the rivers and streams clouded with soil. The fish inherited murky homes. And without trees and clean water, beavers couldn't build their dams to live in. Without the protection of the dams, fish, amphibians, and otters suffered even more. 
and all because of the missing wolf. Now, with as many as 100 gray wolves in Yellowstone National Park, their reintroduction is having an effect that even surprised scientists. Wolves have contributed to bringing elk numbers down from 17,000 in 1995 to just 4,000 today. Since only the healthiest of elk survive, the population is much more robust. All of these elk kills mean more carcasses for scavengers like coyotes, eagles, and ravens. Grizzly bear numbers have increased too. The grizzlies benefit from the wolves' elk kills, and less elk also means more berries. And just the elk's fear of wolves gives the riverbank trees, like aspen and willow, a chance to regenerate. They can grow to five times their original size in just six years. The songbirds are returning too. And the bigger trees along the rivers means greater root structures, which means stronger riverbanks and less erosion. Clean water and big trees, beaver paradise. The return of the beaver dams creates new habitats for fish, amphibians, reptiles, and even otters. This shows just some of the trickle-down effects of the wolves' reintroduction, known to scientists as a trophic cascade. The trophic cascade doesn't stop there, though. The wolves are even helping us. In 2005, over 100,000 visitors went to Yellowstone National Park just to see the wolves. Pumping $30 million into the local economy, money for jobs and livelihoods. Factor in that wolves contribute to the health and diversity of all Yellowstone's wildlife, and its impact is staggering. The wolf's benefits also cascade down to the 106,000 residents of Billings, Montana. Their drinking water, Yellowstone River, is now cleaner. Who would have thought that just bringing back some wolves could produce such far-reaching benefits for nature and for people? From the tips of taller trees down to its cleaner rivers, these wild wolves have rebalanced and restored our nation's very first national park. In 1995, well, I, I'm glad you clapped at that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's actually a, a really nice visualization of some of the research that people like Ripple and Beshta have been doing over the last uh, about 20 years. Are there any questions or thoughts or responses to that? Yeah. Uh, we need to pass the mic around. Or I, I can just repeat the question, maybe? Uh, have there, uh, the question is, have there been any uh, deaths or, or injuries to humans from uh, wolf-human interactions? Uh, within the, the Western states, I do not know of any actual um, uh, documented uh, predation upon human beings or interactions like that. There have been in other places around the globe. Uh, there have been some uh, recent uh, uh, areas or some, some recent wolf predation on human beings in parts of China uh, where we're also seeing uh, wolf recovery as well in certain places. But within the uh, northwestern states, we do not have any signs of that right now that I know of. Maybe someone else does. Anne? Well, that's the next, next part of the lecture. So Ann goes, well, what was the justification for removing the wolves in the first place? Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And we're going to get into, uh, for a few minutes, a little bit about the history of wolf ex extirpation, both in 
uh, North America, but also globally as well. And it's, a, it's issues of fear and supersti superstition and um, e economic concerns and, and also um, some wrong assumptions about the way the science works. Uh, and we'll learn a little bit from Otto Leopold with that. Question. So what, what's your name? Paul. So Paul was saying that uh, in his reading, in the last 125 years, there hasn't been uh, a lot of documentation of uh, wolf-human uh, predation or wolf predation on humans in North America. Other places in India and elsewhere that we see, more, see it more commonly. And he's right. Uh, the reason for this is that the gray wolf, the Canis lupus, is one of the most wary one of the largest and also the one, one of the most reclusive of the wolf uh, species. Um, very adaptable, right? And just if there's any hunters maybe in the room, um, you know, if you go out in the coast range, the one that you worry about are cougars, right? That's the one. You, you look up when you go hunting, right? You go, at least where I go hunting, you, go, you look up into the trees because at 5.30 in the morning, they like to, they like to pounce, right? So... Um, but wolves, you don't really have that much of an issue. Yeah, Dave. So, so Dave was saying that, that with the uh, Air Force, that they were saying that the wolf fur was uh, the best that they could use for uh, lining their uh, bomber jackets and stuff like that because it's uh, the insulating properties. Um, I don't know about that, but it sounds likely. Yeah. Okay. Wooden frost up. Okay. Any other thoughts or responses to anything in the video? Before we kind of move on? Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll, if you want to watch this video, there's also another really good video called How Wolves Change Rivers that you can type in actually on YouTube and find it. It's uh, the same story, a little bit more uh, fantastically told, um, and also it has an uh, English uh, narrator so that you get that sort of European flavor to it. Um, <coughs> um, now, I'm a policy guy, as I said. I, I'm using uh, wolf management and wolf recovery in Oregon uh, primarily as a case study in this piece that I'm working on. Um, and primarily what I'm looking at here is something that as a policy person we're, I'm, I'm actually really quite fascinated about. Is we often think of policy as kind of being homegrown, if you will. Right? And we, th we, we think about Oregon's own legacy about environmental policy, and we, we tell, uh, we, we've developed stories and narratives about our own history as a, as a state and, and relationship with the environment and how that is a, a source of much of our responses to environmental questions. That is true. But as a policy guy, we think of those as kind of internal factors, right? The internal factors that may um, lead to the development of certain types of policy. Internal factors include things like um, economics and economic stakeholders. They include questions about educational levels within a state or a locality. It includes um, political culture, and that's what I was just kind of mentioning in terms of our own uh, experience as a state uh, concerned about environmental questions. Um, it can also be such things as the structure of our legislative system in Oregon. Uh, 
you know, bicameral legislative body uh, with uh, th that's uh, citizen legislature and not professionalized. Uh, as a policy person, those are all things that we take into account when we're looking at the development of policy. But we also have to look at the sort of external factors, right? Uh, we are in a federal system uh, in the United States where uh, we have another dominant actor on the policy landscape, and that's the federal government. Um, and under our Constitution, in many cases, uh, uh, the Supremacy Clause comes into effect, and what the federal government says dictates uh, certain requirements to the states. And on environmental policy and biodiversity policy specifically, we see that sort of presence of the federal government as we as states respond to issues of biodiversity protection. So wolf recovery and wolf management provides a really unique example of that type of external factor. The other thing is, is that when Oregon makes policy, it doesn't act in a vacuum. It sees what's happening in other states. And that's an external factor as well. That's quite interesting with regard to wolf management and wolf recovery. We could see what was happening at the state level in places like Wyoming and Idaho and Montana, Washington State, and back in the 1970s in places like Minnesota, Michigan, and Wisconsin. Right? All that had um, wolves come into their territories earlier than they did into Oregon. So as good uh, legislative uh, personnel and as policymakers within agencies, they were out scanning and seeing what was occurring at the state level in these other locations. So for me, wolves provide a really unique example of this sort of external and internal pressure uh, within a federal system for the development of public policy with a specific focus on uh, um, biodiversity policy. Uh, I just want to point out the, the, the person here in this uh, picture up here in the right corner is uh, Russ Morgan, who's been a, a, li a lifetime employee of the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and became engaged on wolf recovery and management in Oregon from the beginning and is now the coordinator for the state. And he's been in that role pretty much since 2005 with the development of the state policy. So, and a couple of my students have been able to work with him over the years. Um, and again, one of the great things about my job is I learn from my students. They come back with these great experiences working with people like Russ, and then it draws my attention to these issues that I might not have otherwise done. So, <coughs> um, so returning to the question that Anne asked, why did we get rid of wolves? And there's been actually quite a few books and articles actually written on this over the years. And, and a lot of it has to do with the way that we represent wolves historically within our culture right? and how they come to embody certain things and certain fears uh, and certain concerns about competition. And just think about the stories that maybe you grew up with, right? Whether it was in Grimm's fairy tales, right? Uh, the the um, Little Red Riding Hood. Oh my, what? Oh grandma what big teeth you have um, and you know so I have pictures of Little Red Riding Hood and Rotkopfchen here which the in, in the German um, and there's actually been some really interesting research done uh, that uh, came that was published in 2011 tracing tracing Little Red Riding Hood stories and a similar story uh, going back to at least the 11th century Right, uh, just that one story alone, right, and the and the and the lessons that we learn about fearing large predators and how they're deceptive, and how they prey upon people, and that the only response to something like a predator like that is violence, right? The 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 woodsman who comes in and kills the wolf with an axe in most stories, um, but also we can go back to the ancient Greeks and Aesop's fables, right, and think about. The, the Boy Who Cried Wolf, right? Uh, one of the 12 stories within Aesop's fables where you have a wolf present, and almost in all of those, in a negative light, an evil light. The other one, wolf in sheep's clothing, right? Think of how we use that as a metaphor so within our society today. Um, and certainly think about our other images of 
the supernatural wolf, right? The werewolves, right? Changelings uh, that prey upon humans or somehow come to take over humans. And you know, this is, we have for generations, particularly in the Occidental West, utilized wolves as a sign of what is evil, what needs to be controlled, what needs to be extirpated. But there's also some really good kind of evolutionary biological reasons why we probably developed an inordinate and innate uh, fear of wolves. Because as humans were uh, evolving uh, in prehistoric times, we did domesticate uh, part of the Canis uh, species, right? Part of the Canis family, right? That's domesticated dogs 15,000 years ago, uh, you know, uh, uh, split off of uh, uh, the, uh, the Canis genus um, by associating with human beings. But wolves hunting in packs were a major competitive source for food for human beings. Right? Uh, and wolves are found globally, right? So wherever you found the emergence of, of humans in communities, there was a wolf species that was probably in competition for, with human beings. So there are some historical and evolutionary reasons probably why we have a, an innate fear of wolves. Any questions there or thoughts? There have been alternative understandings of wolves as well, some that are a little bit more complex, right? But not necessarily idealizing wolves, but if we think in many, uh, in many parts of the world, indigenous cultures have uh, seen wolves as being a totemic animal, right? Uh, part of the spirit world, often in many cases, a teacher, um, a, a wise teacher, a curious teacher, but also a, a potential source of competition, right? And if we look at the tribes of the Pacific Northwest, we see this as a uh, one of the images or one of the narratives of gray wolves historically in this part of North America. Wolves were totemic, wolves were something that were considered to be extended family, but they were also ones that were not necessarily always to be trusted. And I, I uh, made reference to that this is not just something that happened in North America. We have extirp extirpated wolves globally throughout their ranges. Wolves are one of the most adaptive predator species in the world. They can be found on any continent. Um, but we have also hunted them to extinction in many parts of the world, right? Whether we're talking about Europe, whether we're talking about parts of uh, Central Asia, or as uh, we come to European settlement into North America, we began systematically hunting and exterminating wolves in the 16th and 17th centuries. Um, <clears throat> this is actually uh, one, a picture from uh, uh, northeastern China where they are, uh, because of the expansion of many of the urban areas in northeastern China, that they are today experiencing wolf-human interactions in a way that are threatening some of the communities there. <clears throat> Oregon's own history with wolves is complex. Um, some of you probably know uh, a bit about Oregon's uh, establishment uh, after initial uh, arrival of pioneers, uh, European pioneers in the early 19th century that, um, and, and even the, the attachment of Willamette University to wolf extirpation within this region. Um, we have Jason Lee down here um, who uh, founded Willamette University or the Oregon Institute in 1842. We also have William H. Gray who was one of the early members also of the Oregon Institute or Willamette University coming to the uh, Institute in, 19, in 1842 as well. As you know at the point in time before 1843 there was not an organized government in uh, the Oregon Territory. Or, I mean, the Oregon Territory wasn't even really defined. It was an area that had been in the, the source of geopolitical conflict from the late 18th century into the early 19th century. 
there were claims to this area from both Spain, Russia, and the United States, and Britain. And actually, up until 1837, the main political force here was the Hudson's Bay Company, right? And uh, John McLaughlin, who was the uh, rector, um, the, uh, the director of the Hudson's Bay Company within the Northwest Territories at that time. Um, well, as more Amer uh, uh, American settlers start to come into the area in the late 1830s and early 1840s, they're trying to find a way to organize. Right? In 1841, 1842, there was only 500 American settlers in all of the Oregon Territory, right? Not just Oregon, but what we would now say is Washington and Idaho as well. Less than 500. By 1843, there had been about another thousand that had come into it. So we're talking about 1,500 American settlers by 1843, but still no political organization. Well, William H. Gray is usually credited with saying, we've got to find a common reason to organize. And you know what it is? It's those big predators that, it's those big predators that are threatening our livestock and threatening our persons. And so we, they formed in 18, February of 1843, the first Wolf Committee, right? Um, an organization that was about six individuals, including William H. Gray, that came together to say, we've got to produce some sort of form of government that can help us extirpate these wolves. They met in February of 1843, they met in February, uh, March of 1843, and then we're kind of familiar with what happened at the Wolf Committee meeting in uh, May of 1843 at Shampooey, which was where the provisional government was formed, right? And we, you know, we, we know about the, the vote of 52 for and 50 against, right? Um, in Oregon history. But it really started by saying we have to find some way to, or, to, to systematically remove wolves from the landscape. And their first action was to establish a bounty to remove, uh, for each killed wolf, and it was 50 cents. For, uh, well, 50 cents for a small wolf and $3 for a large wolf. Right? And it was actually pretty darn successful. The last wolf in Oregon prior to the last 15 years was killed in Oregon in the Umpqua Valley in 1946 and it was turned in for a bounty of five dollars. Right. And in 1946 that appeared to be the end of wolves in Oregon. Right. But we weren't alone. Right. We had other states had removed wolves Earlier than that, they actually remained in Oregon for longer than in places like New Mexico and Arizona and Wyoming and elsewhere. <coughs> we were simply doing what even Aldo Leopold had uh, relished participating in in the 1920s. You know, we think today of Aldo Leopold as being kind of the environmental saint of the 20th century, right? Um, almost the John the Baptist of the environmental movement. But he was trained as a forester. His first job was as a forest ranger in New Mexico and Arizona. And he participated in wolf hunts. And he, he tells a little bit of, about this in one of the essays with, that's captured in uh, a San County Almanac, uh, the essay that's entitled Thinking Like a Mountain. And I've just kind of excerpted a little bit of it here. Um, and I think it kind of captures the thinking of the time, but also a realization that we were going to lose something. So he's describing how he and some friends, uh, other Forest Service buddies, that they're out on the landscape and they happen to see this pack of wolves and they all pull out their rifles because every forest ranger carried a, 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 um, a, a long rifle with them as part of the standard issue. And they just started shooting up the pack. And this one wolf 
a female kind of goes off and they start to hunt her down. Right? We reached the old wolf in time to watch a fierce green fire dying in her eyes. I realized then that I have known and I have known ever since that there was something new to me in those eyes, something known only to her and to the mountain. I was young then and full of trigger itch. I thought that because fewer wolves meant more deer, that no wolves would mean hunter's paradise. But after seeing the green fire die, I sensed that neither the wolf nor the mountain agreed with such a view. Right. And this is kind of the beginning of his whole notion of thinking like a mountain. Right. The mountain needed the wolf. In the same way that we see in that research from Ripple and Beshta, that the Gallatin River, the Yellowstone ecosystem, needs wolves on the landscape in order to provide clean water for human communities, fish for fishers and recreational fishers and for the tribes, beavers, even the rabbits on the landscape. The, the, the mountain wasn't happy <laughs> without the wolves on the landscape. And this is something that it took us a long time to realize. And we were realizing it in the 1950s, the 1960s, at the beginning of the modern environmental movement. And this culminated when we're thinking about biodiversity policy in 1973 with the passage of the Endangered Species Act. Right? signed into law in February by Richard Nixon in 1973. Now we did have, prior to 1973, other federal laws that helped us to maintain some biodiversity, probably most prominently the Lacey Act from the early 1900s. Uh, and then in, 18, in 1967, we passed kind of an earlier version of the Endangered Species Act. But they did very little other than to help us study many of the issues that we're facing with root loss, uh, with regards to biodiversity law, loss. But the Endangered Species Act really set us on a different trajectory. And I just want to spend a couple minutes talking a little bit about what occurred with the Endangered Species Act before we start seeing how this plays out in Oregon a little bit more. Well, the Endangered Species Act was really unique because it was available for all, or for all species, not just those that were commercially viable or commercially important. All right, so even little critters like worms and snails and plants, they could all be covered under the Endangered Species Act. The Endangered Species Act also allows for the protection of habitat for those species. The recognition that a species without habitat is not a viable species. Um, and it gives joint authority, oddly, to two agencies, right? the Fish and Wildlife Service, which is the Department of the Interior, and then uh, NOAA Fisheries, or, which is within the Department of Commerce. One of the issues that remains to this day about the enforcement of the Endangered Species Act. Um, and then it also provides for a way to list these species, and the species can be listed by you and I, or we can petition to have a species listed. It's called a citizen's petition or an agency themselves, based upon their own research or in con consultation with others, can decide that a species is warranted to be listed. Right? Which do you think is the most common way for a species to be listed under the Endangered Species Act? By citizen petition or from within an agency? How many, how many people say federal agency? How many people say citizen petition? Citizen petition, about 75% actually have their origins in citizen petitions, right? I, I'm not, I know there's a lot of agency employees here, and you all know that you're busy, right? And when it comes to actually going through the process of listing a species, agencies just are often too busy to do this. They have other priorities, right? So most, most listings actually come from citizens. But what's interesting, actually, is that wolf listing in 1974 was actually done by the agencies. So that is important. Uh, just a kind of brief thing here in terms of the success of the, of the Endangered Species Act. It has been surprisingly successful in many ways. Right? Uh, it is still the strongest 
Endangered Species Act globally in terms of what it's capable of doing, right? And in most cases, it has allowed for recovery of some species and it has prevented uh, the extinction of many species, right? Though 10 have become extinct while being listed. Right? It does, uh, there are lots of issues we can talk about with the Endangered Species Act and maybe during questions I can answer some of those. Moving back to wolves, gray wolves were listed in 1974 uh, within the lower 48 states with a primary focus upon the, the Great Lakes region. Right? Minnesota, um, Wisconsin, and Michigan. Uh, at that time, for those populations, for the Great Lakes populations of gray wolves, they actually established critical habitat. That's kind of important uh, because that affects the way that individuals, including private individuals, can use these areas where wolves might be found. Right? As wolves moved west, and as we started thinking about Rocky Mountain wolves, or now wolves in Oregon, there has been no critical habitat designated. And we can maybe talk about that too, that's why that was occurred. Uh, critical habitat designation happened in 1976 for that Great, Great Lakes population. <clears throat> of critical importance for this discussion today is that the Endangered Species Act provides for the establishment of what we call experimental populations or non-essential populations. And that plays into where we are with Oregon. Uh, experimental populations are treated uh, as threatened as, as opposed to endangered. They receive threatened protection. But there is a greater flexibility with the way that they can be managed as opposed to what would be considered a native or natural population of an endangered species. This plays out particularly of importance in the West because the wolves in Oregon are seen as being the offspring of an experimental population that was released into Idaho and Yellowstone in the mid-1990s. Right? So they are considered to be the offspring of an experimental population that is non-essential. <coughs> Which brings us to this idea of what happened in 1995 and 1996 in the American West. We're going to focus on the, uh, the results of that reintroduction of species, but things were already occurring, particularly in the northern Rockies, that were signs of encouragement about wolves. The, um, <clears throat> and there was a great debate in the 1990s, late 1980s and early 1990s, about wolves in the American West. Should wolves be allowed to repopulate this area naturally, or should there be an attempt to reintroduce wolves from somewhere else? Well, when we think of places like Yellowstone or uh, the Bitterroots in Montana or the other northern Rockies, where might natural populations of wolves be coming from? Canada, right? And that was occurring. Uh, Diane Boyd here is often called the Jane Goodall of wolves, uh, who we actually had the, when I first came here in the mid-1990s, she was one of the first speakers I was able to bring uh, in 1997. She came and spoke at Willamette. Uh, she was great. She's actually now in charge of wolf recovery in the state of Montana. Uh, but she, in the mid-1980s, she was a grad student at University of Montana, working with Bill Ream on uh, wolves in the northern Rockies, and they had been able to radio collar and track some individual wolves that were migrating down from um, uh, the Canadian Rockies. So Reem and Boyd said, we should not be upsetting the apple cart and introducing wolves to this area. They're going to come naturally, we just have to make space for them. Right? They were ignored. And in 1995, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Nez Perce tribe released um, 66 wolves into Yellowstone National Park in central Idaho, 35 into, or 31 into um, Yellowstone and 35 into Idaho, 95 and 96. Within a year, those 66 wolves were 115 wolves. 
And so began what has become a bit of a journey, right? So this is 2011, which shows the individual wolf packs um, that are considered to be kind of the offspring of this experimental population. Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, even at this point in time, you can see some established in Oregon and Washington State. The population here is we're looking at about 1,700 wolves by 2011. Uh, that is even with uh, significant culling or killing within the states of um, uh, Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho. 2015, this is what the map looks like that from the population. Over 300 wolf packs from, that are seen as being the offspring of those original 66 wolves. A few have strayed in from uh, the Canadian Rockies as well, but most of this is because of that reintroduction of wolves to those two areas. Diane Boyd today says it has been a huge success, right? this reintroduction of wolves in the area. Um, should we ask some questions or take a break? Questions? Yeah. Okay. question is about genetic diversity within the wolves. Uh, I know that is a concern, right? Um, but there seems to be, um, I, they're continu continuing to do the genetic tests. Uh, so far, the population does not seem to be uh, feeling inordinate threats from the kind of a narrowing of the genetic material. There seems to be enough coming down occasionally from places like the Canadian Rockies to reintroduce that. I mean, wolves move 600, 700 uh, miles a season, right? There are roamers. Yeah, question. Uh, I've noticed in Yellowstone there's so many of the gray wolves are black, mm -hmm. and I have heard that that is in breeding with domestic, some domestic dogs, but where does the black come from? I, it's just, uh, you know, you'd have to ask a, uh, uh, a geneticist more on this, but it's just recessive genes, I mean, uh, black, gray, brown, white uh, are all just part of the natural coloring of the species. Yeah. Uh, you remember 1080? That's really horrible poison that they were using to kill coyotes and stuff. I think that was outlawed by Richard Nixon. Isn't that correct? Um, you mean the, the poison for uh, the poisoning of, of coyotes? Co coyotes and other wildlife, and it, it and it went down the chain because other animals would eat that that animal, and then they would die. Yeah, uh, I I I I can't give you a definitive answer on that. I think you're right on that that it was outlawed, but I I probably came under Tosca, All right? So maybe someone else knows the answer to that. Question? Yeah. Um, what is the, uh, oh, this is Mika, what is the um, natural um, predator on wolves? What controls wolves? Question is, what controls wolves? Well, um, it depends. Cougars, right? Other wolves, um, they often are killed uh, by um, taking on what they think is a prey that turns out to actually be able to defend itself pretty well, moose, caribou, elk, right? Um, humans are a top predator. Bears. Um, so y you have these, this kind of group of apex predators particularly, um, bears, wolves, cougars, that um, tend to not necessarily get along. They tend to dis disperse themselves across the landscape. Uh, and they tend to, at times, prey on each other, right? So, and humans as well. Ms. Lester, uh, I remember in w when we were in, uh, I was looking for wolves in Yellowstone in the winter, uh -huh. and we came across a pack that had uh, mange in it, and I remember hearing that uh, it's either Montana or Wyoming introduced mange as a predator, or controlled species when they were trying to get rid of them. 
Yeah, I think it was Wyoming. Yeah, it was introduced. Yeah. I have a question. My name is Stephen, Stephen Moe. Um, how successful has it been to when they, I know for a while they were, uh, it was in the news that they were transplanting some uh, wolves that had attacked domestic animals and, and do the wolves come, usually come back to the same region or is that been a successful program? So, so the question is um, w when there's been um, harassment of livestock or depredation of livestock, one of the things that the state of Oregon can do, and some of the other states too, is they can physically remove the wolf, not, 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 uh, not kill it, but they can physically remove it to another location. The question is how effective is that? It depends. Sometimes it's been effective. Uh, for, in the, for the Imnaha pack, which is one, or was one of the packs in north, uh, northeastern Oregon, it wasn't successful. And so the, that pack has actually been eliminated because they, they just couldn't stop the predation. Another question? Yep. Right here. Kasia. Oh, hi. Yeah. Um, what is the natural lifespan of a wolf, barring accident, illness, and people? And how many, how many, how do the families fare, wolf families, in terms of, you know, numbers of offspring and survival rates? Um, I don't have, you know, I, I'm, I'm not the, I, I, on that sort of part of the biology, I'm not fully versed, but they can, they can live for 20 years, but I think in the wild, the natural, I, I think a 10-year-old wolf is a pretty old wolf in, in natural areas. We know that in these areas where they're expanding into, that the wolf pup rate, you know, they're having three to four to a litter, but in a place where there would be more competition, you know, like in Canada and elsewhere, they would be having one to two. So there's clearly a lot of resources out there, and that's why they're expanding so quickly. I think that led to when I'm Dave, is seeing how the, the packs are increasing, so that must mean that there's also uh, a food source to support those, is that correct? Yeah, I mean, they're, you know, they, they, um, they love the ungulates, uh, you know, elk, deer particularly. Um, and, you know, um, there are recreationists that are concerned about that within Oregon in terms of their impacts upon, um, you know, recreational hunting, particularly in eastern Oregon. Um, they do, you know, if, uh, if they're presented with a tasty morsel uh, that happens to be a lamb or a cow or something like that, um, they, they, they will go there. Um, the, the rate of that happening, and we'll talk a little bit about that in the, uh, after the break, is, is pretty minimal in terms of the number of documented uh, livestock kills. Um, but, you know, I, I don't want to underestimate or denigrate those who see that as a real concern. Um, but what, what it does look like is in most cases, they like prey that runs right um, and it's only typically in uh, when there are, uh, are older adults within the packs that are having a harder time hunting that they tend to go for the docile domesticated species right my mom's 94 years old uh, she used to cook up a storm she doesn't cook as much as she used to um, you know it's easier for her to get something that's prepared and I, for 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 older for, for older wolves, I, that's that's partly what's going on. So, uh, this is Danny. Um, is the population now stable, and is there going to be migration southward in both states? There's a lot of white space there. Well, uh, we'll talk about that in the next in the next hour. I, I don't know if you'd call it stable. I mean, we're, we're still on the upward. Uh, on you know the, when we think about population dynamics, we often think of J curves in the beginning, and we're still on the J curve. We're still going up. One last question before the break. Now, the Native Americans, of course, have been uh, in the in the U.S. interacting with those wolves for centuries before the uh, European settlers came. Uh, any knowledge about the interaction, say, well, in Oregon uh, with all the various uh, tribes in Oregon and other parts of the country, whether um, 
it, they kind of coexisted, so to speak, without aggressive hunting necessarily. Yeah, I, 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 I that I maybe didn't do a very good job explaining it, but you know, you know, European settlers tended to see the wolves primarily in a fully negative light and seeing them in terms of competition. I think Aldo Leopold captures that, right? That, you know, uh, um, uh, a landscape without wolves was a hunter's paradise, right? Uh, or a rancher's paradise. Um, Native Americans tended to see it much more of a mixed bag, right? And they were uh, uh, much more respectful, I think, of wolves on the landscape. Um, maybe saw, that, saw their role in keeping um, their, their own food sources healthy, right? I mean, when you have wolves in the landscape, you get healthier deer populations, right? Uh, overall, that you have less issues of diseases running through the, um, running through the herds. Um, and when we're looking at wolf recovery now, um, the Nez Perce tribe and some of the other tribes have been really some of the main uh, advocates for wolf recovery throughout the American West. And it was the Nez Perce that really pushed the reintroduction. All right, I see we have more questions, but I think it's time for a break, so thank you very much. Okay, um, well, uh, so this is kind of a broader map of uh, where we are today, but I wanna now step back and talk much more specifically about how Oregon has approached um, the presence of wolves uh, within our territory. And actually the first wolves out of that uh, kind of pulse coming out of uh, central Idaho and uh, Yellowstone came into Oregon in 1999. Uh, B45 uh, was a wolf that uh, had dispersed from one of the Idaho packs and it crossed over into Oregon, hung around and caused tremendous consternation for about three or four months uh, in the first part of, of 1999. Um, our wildlife officials and our local politicians and our economic interests were sitting there saying, what do we do about this? We don't want it. And actually, um, quite surprisingly, and probably against Oregon state law, what uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife did is they trapped the wolf and actually transported it back to Idaho in, um, in the summer of 1999. And we actually did that again in 2000 uh, uh, when another wolf came across. And in 2001 and 2002, a couple more wolves wandered in. Uh, one was killed by a car near Baker City and one was shot. Um, um, so in those early years, 1999 to 2002, Oregon was really kind of like, oh man, are we going to have to deal with this? Can't it just go away? Can't we find some other way to deal with it? I mean, because it was something that was, I mean, people knew it was going to be a source of consternation and conflict, right? The cattle industry in Oregon is very big. The livestock industry in Oregon is very big. It's a huge economic engine in particular parts of, the, of our state. There's over 1.3 million cows in the state of Oregon. Um, we won't even get into the number of sheep and other livestock. And so this is a serious economic engine for, much of our, for many of our communities. And there was a great, um, great fear about what this would mean for many of our communities. Uh, and they only had to look at other places where, um, in, in places like uh, Minnesota and Montana, the presence of wolves had led to a 400% a increase in depredation right, amongst certain livestock growers, livestock owners. That was the great fear. This was going to mean, you know, economic devastation for members of our community. So, rightly so, one might say is there is a real concern about whether um, our agency personnel, our legislative personnel, really wanted to touch this third rail. Right? No one saw it as something winning. By 2001, you had the uh, livestock industry actually trying to delist. Uh, the wolf, uh, the gray wolf from the Oregon Endangered Species Act through legislative, um, um, uh, through, through uh, a bill that was introduced. 
Um, you had the Oregon Natural Desert Association that was suing uh, the cattle industry in uh, federal and state courts over um, um, responses to wolves. And so things were looking like it was just going to go south really, really quickly with regards to wolves. Um, and at the same time, uh, at the beginning part of the Bush administration, is that you had some interesting things happening there where the um, um, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and Department of Interior were trying to delist wolves uh, or downgrade wolves from endangered to threatened. And so there was a lot of kind of um, uncertainty surrounding how the state of Oregon was going to address wolves. Um, but in response to this consternation and conflict, Oregon actually did kind of step up. And it decided to try something fairly unique. And in 2004, the Oregon Wa uh, Fish and Wildlife Commission um, decided to uh, support the development of a stakeholder group that would help draft a wolf recovery and management uh, plan. It was called the Wolf Advisory Committee. And they started out with some interesting principles that kind of set it apart. And that um, they wanted to have the stakeholder group as uh, have as broad as rep re representation as possible. Um, folks from um, local municipalities and state government or county governments there would be um, uh, economic interests from the li livestock industry there there would be environmentalists represented um, and this wolf advisory committee would also have a series of technical committees that would be staffed by agency personnel to collect information to provide the best scientific and best economic information to the advisory committee as they moved forward they also, uh, something that is quite unique, particularly with regards to environmental policy, is they uh, worked under the principle of consensus decision making. Right? That's difficult, particularly when you're dealing with something like this. They had provisions for how to deal with uh, decisions where they couldn't reach a consensus, but the objective was always to reach consensus. Right? Staying in the room, staying in your seat, continuing to converse, continuing to listen to the other position. Right? Um, they also decided that they were only going to manage arriving wolves; that they were not going to have, they were not going to touch wolf reintroduction. All right, and they set themselves a compromise objective to ensure the long-term survival and conservation of brave wolves as required by Oregon law while minimizing conflicts with humans, primary land uses, and other Oregon wildlife. And that's taken directly from these uh, kind of operating principles of the Wolf Advisory Committee that was established. And in 2005, they actually were able to produce a plan by consensus, almost, with good buy-in from almost all the groups, almost. Right? And they kind of established certain components within it. First was this notion of balance, that it was neither a wolf reintroduction plan nor a wolf eradication plan, that they would build in flexibility that would provide for safe communities and, um, uh, and safe property. Flexibility would, would deal with uh, issues of how to deal with uh, depredation of livestock, how it, uh, whether that would be done solely by ODF and W personnel, um, whether there would be uh, an ability for a landowner to respond to an on-site um, uh, wolf attack, et cetera. Uh, it provided for a mechanism for compensation for documented livestock deaths resulting from wolf harassment and, and uh, uh, killing. Uh, and then a process for phase delisting of the wolf within Oregon based upon region and breeding success. Um, it withstood in 2005 a couple of court challenges. It withstood 
uh, some attempts by the state legislature to override it, um, and then went into enforce, oh, and it also withstood a couple of um, additional lawsuits and um, maneuverings from the federal government uh, throughout the course of 2005. But it went into f effect on December 31st, 2005, if I remember my date correctly. And just from, you know, I, as a policy guy, I was really, uh, again, trying to focus on a couple of things here in terms of this notion of internal influences and external influences. And just very quickly, I'll run through these uh, to, because, you know, I have to earn my keep somehow, right, as, as a policy person. And so when we're looking at sort of internal influences that affected the development of this policy, is that we have public opinion. Beginning in 2001, there was statewide uh, op opinion polling done on uh, wolf recovery in Oregon, and it has consistently remained about 70% in favor of wolf recovery in Oregon, even if there's an economic cost to it. Right? Um, Oregon re retains this uh, uh, political culture. Um, sometimes I like to describe it as kind of green libertarianism. Um, I, I, but, you know, Many of us were born and raised, or we inherited this, you know, kind of McCall notion of uh, conservation and, and concern for the environment, um, and and that drives a lot of our uh, policies, uh, both at the local level and at the state level. You know, it, it's 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 um, it would um, we are not environmental saints, right? Certainly, we have a lot of issues where we still face. Uh, uh, face problems. Um, hopefully we'll see that even in this notion of wolf recovery, that's one of the areas where we still face a number of problems. But there's still this idea that we want to find some sort of balance. Right? Um, you know, Oregon was a home for a long time of kind of cloth coat Republicans, right? Uh, fiscal conservatives and social liberals. And I mean, I think that continues to, we see a lot of that within um, the, the general environmental consensus within the state today. You can challenge me on that, but I think we're still somewhere in that vein of the way that we think about the environment. So I put it here, kind of McCall's, uh, Tom McCall's Oregon. Right? Um, we have well-organized economic stakeholders in, play, in things like the Oregon Cattlemen's Association, very organized, uh, very present within uh, legislative circles and lobbying at the agency level. So they're very present, but on the other hand, they're uh, countered by very organized environmental interests within the state of Oregon that are present at the state legislature and also present at the agency level as well. So there's a, there's a, there's a balance there, if you will, even within those conflicts. Um, but when it comes to our legislative activity with regards to the environment, particularly in the early 2000s, it was uncertain and in many cases reactive. Right? Um, this was a period of time when we're looking at uh, uh, chamber control across the street. It was uh, tenuous, largely divided. We went through periods of time when we had equal representation of both Democrats and Republicans, so a lot of things weren't getting done. So that actually opened up the possibility of some room for uh, kind of administrative policy making on the part of the agency and this Wolf Advisory Committee. On the external side, we did see a very aggressive um, uh, federal uh, presence with regards to wolf policy in the early 2000s, uh, but it was actually quite confusing under the Bush administration uh, we actually here ha we see uh, George Bush and uh, then Governor Dick Kempthorne from uh, Idaho uh, kind of looking at um, um, uh, as part of the landscape. This is actually a picture where he was looking at forestry. I mean, this is also the time of the Healthy Forest Restoration Act and that sort of stuff. But um, you know, the, with regards to uh, wolf recovery and wolf management at the federal level during this period of time, you had a, the the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service trying actively trying to delist the wolf. Um, and you also had them actively trying to downgrade wolf 
uh, the wolf from endangered to threatened. They were actually successful on that. But you had these suits and countersuits that were going, popping back and forth in the federal court at this time. And actually in the midst of writing the Oregon uh, management plan, there was a series of decisions going back and forth that left the advisory committee, as well as the Oregon Fish and Wildlife Commission, really questioning where they stood on federal grounds. Um, <clears throat> and then you had, when you, we looked out beyond Oregon, is you had some really highly politicized uh, responses to wolf presence in places like Washington State, Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming. Um, and uh, the states of Wyoming and Idaho and Montana, as soon as possible, actually moved to the introduction of um, um, uh, game hunts for wolves, right? and delisting at the state level. And so you saw these kind of radical changes in populations of wolves within these states and real pressures from um, various interests to move beyond uh, conservation of the species to treating it as you would any other game species. Um, many of these things were done at the legislative level. Um, our wildlife folks, the Wolf Advisory Committee, looked at these other states and said, we don't really want to go down there. Right? We don't want to go down that route. And we're trying to find something that would be much more of a balance. <clears throat> now, to interrupt this for just a moment, um, another little video. So, um, just to kind of set this up, so we pass, uh, or we approved the Wolf uh, Management Plan in 2005. It was amended in 2010. Um, and we went through a period of time between about 2006 and 2008 where the, the presence of wolves in Oregon seemed to be in, intermittent and not well documented. And then in 2008, it started to change. We had documented sightings uh, by uh, wildlife officers and also documented evidence that there was now a breeding pair, a pack, in Oregon by 2008, three years after the passage of the plan. And so suddenly, things became really serious. Uh, and so what I have here is just a, um, a short, uh, short video. It does not have sound. Uh, of um, one of these early wolves un, uh, uh, cavorting in northeastern Oregon um, soon after these things all became serious. You know, seeing is believing, particularly for wildlife managers. So seeing is believing, suddenly it all became serious, and uh, from that initial uh, confirmation in 2008 of a, of a, a pack in Oregon, um, 
by 2010, I believe there was 29 that were seen as being in Oregon. Uh, there was actually some um, culling of uh, wolves by state uh, wildlife officers uh, by 2010 of about four or five individuals. It caused a significant amount of consternation amongst uh, parts of uh, the, the environmental community. Um, it was also a time when uh, the game hunts in places like Wyoming and Idaho in one year alone took over a thousand wolves uh, from the population in, in uh, Wyoming and Idaho. Uh, so there was a real concern that we were, uh, amongst many, that we were moving into kind of a, um, a potential open season on wolves. It didn't occur, right? State of Oregon came back through and revised the wolf management plan in 2010. Uh, actually, uh, at that point in time, said that they weren't going to move towards such things as a game hunt, uh, even though that is a potential possibility under the management plan at a certain point. But they said we were going to retain control of this, that we were going to reemphasize conservation of the species. And where we are today, uh, and we'll talk a little about here in some where we are uh, in terms of numbers and locations, is we have in Oregon, as of December 2016, at minimum 112 wolves on the ground. Right? It's probably, most seem to be estimating that there's probably 20 to 30 individuals on top of that. But, but known to be 112 wolves in 12 different packs, I believe seven of those are breeding packs. Um, they are primarily located in northeastern Oregon. Uh, there are only 12 individuals that are um, south of I-84. Right, so they're all kind of northeastern Oregon. There's only 12 individual wolves that are known to be outside or below I-84. Um, <coughs> they uh, are we have moved now to phase uh, one of the lower phase or one of the more advanced phases in terms of the recovery, and we'll talk a little bit about what that means. Um, and we are seeing some impacts upon the uh, livestock industry, um, and um, in terms of both dollar amounts of compensation as well as individual uh, individual livestock that are being uh, killed and documented. Uh, if we're looking at the breakdown of wolf status in Oregon, um, you can. this is by years over the last seven years uh, for the various named packs as well as some of the miscellaneous packs. Um, <clears throat> you can see there the fate of the Imnaha pack up at the top, which was one of the first ones established, and that it's now actually been uh, eliminated <coughs> uh, because of its uh, activities. Um, what we are seeing now, uh, I'll go back to that one map here, is we're seeing some increased activity down here in um, um, southern Oregon and actually west of 395. That's extremely important and significant. And uh, the rogue pack there we'll maybe talk about here in a moment as well. Uh, the rogue pack are, is uh, the result of OR7, maybe the most famous Oregon wolf, right, the one that made all the national news about wandering, and we'll talk about that here in a moment. Um, Oregon um, is divided up into management regions for wolves. Um, they are delisted um, um, east of the blue boundary here, defined by 395 and Highway 78 and 95. Um, they are... Um, that means that wolves west of that demarcation actually still have federal endangered species protection, right? because, simply because their numbers are so low. Uh, under the Endangered Species Act, you can actually protect individual populations or regions. You don't have to delist or protect the entire species. Right? Um, the present wolf management zone boundary is focused to the east of 395 um, and um, that boundary allows more aggressive means of dealing with um, uh, problem wolves 
It allows more flexibility in the part of the landowners or the livestock owners in terms of the responses that can be done um, uh, with approval of the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, but the strongest protections are still east of that red line in terms of what's going on in the western part of the state. Uh, issues remain, right? Uh, and we can talk about this maybe in some questions here in, in a few moments. Um, and I kind of talked about how a phased delisting um, of the species in Oregon under the Oregon Act. Uh, and phase three issues here are whether Oregon should move towards a game hunt on wolves. There is considerable pressure, but there's also pushback actually from the wildlife agency itself and certainly from the environmental community to maintain uh, the species as a managed population and not, not also as a game population. Right? Uh, the culling of wolves today can still only be done by a wildlife officer, an agent of the wildlife agent uh, of the of the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, Department, or a landowner who catches a wolf in the mid in the act of um, uh, killing one of their livestock. Right? Very limited means by which they can legally um, kill a wolf. But we do have another issue with unauthorized wolf kills, and these have been in the news very recently, right, that we have um, uh, some wolves that have been poached uh, illegally uh, throughout the state over the last 18 months. Uh, we have one uh, issue that you might have read about just uh, in the paper or heard on the news in the last week or so about um, a wolf that was killed in self-defense, but now the, uh, the governor uh, and others are questioning and wanting the wildlife agency to look at the, or actually want uh, Oregon State Police to look at that to see if there's enough evidence to say that it was um, um, uh, in defense, uh, 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 that the wolf was killed in defense. Uh, and then there's growing concern about the uh, compensation program that's been established for uh, livestock kills. And in order to kind of, this is actually from the 2016 annual report for wolves. Uh, that you can see that the number of confirmed losses by year from 2009 to 2016, um, that, you know, we're talking about, you know, when, when we think about the 1.3 million cows, we're talking about a small number, right? N small number of documented kills. That's a concern. Part of the, you know, the livestock industry and others are saying that it's too difficult to document an actual kill. Too much is required. Uh, so we might, we, we're, we're seeing some push to try to liberalize the way that we document wolf kills. Right? But we're also seeing largely, I mean, pretty small numbers. It's because in many of the cases, wolves want something that's going to give them a little bit more of a thrill of the hunt, right? Um, um, but you know, when you, if you're a cattle person, if you're if you own cattle and you lose one calf, right, or if you lose one ewe, that's that's significant, right? And we shouldn't be downplaying what it can mean to the livelihoods of some of our fellow citizens, right? Um, when we're looking at the amount of money that's being paid out, right? Um, well, well. Here, too, is that we can see that the number of depredation events uh, related to pop overall populations, that there's a general upward trend uh, as the population continues to increase. Total compensation for wolf depredation in Oregon is 130000 in 2016. Right? Um, so, um, you know, in, in, in tough budget times, um, should we be paying those uh, livestock owners for wolf kills? Or should we be hiring another teacher? Or should we be hiring another police officer? And these are re some real concerns. Right? Um, I should also say here that one of the pressures for a phase three here too is that when a state wildlife officer responds to a um, 
problem wolf, the, the killing of that problem wolf by a state wildlife officer can cost tens of thousands of dollars. Right? And so the argument is, do you want to spend tens of thousands of dollars for that wildlife officer to um, take care of that wolf when the uh, landowner is happy to pull out his 30 out six and put one shell into it? Right? Wouldn't that be a, a, a more efficient way of doing these things? <clears throat> Let's talk about one other more fascinating issue. I mean, I guess they're all fascinating. I don't mean to denigrate those other issues. But one of them that I, I think about, I guess, as a policy person, particularly someone in, living in Salem who has forest land in the coast range, is when we start thinking about dispersal and colonization of these species, of, of wolves in Oregon. Wolves can move hundreds of miles in a single, in a single season. Right. This is actually just some tracing based upon um, uh, uh, GPS data for wolves uh, between 2010 and 2016, where they're going and how they go, and you can see a tremendous amount of range there. <clears throat> um, 112 wolves in Oregon, about 9% of those wolves are radio collared. Here's OR7's journey. Right. Starting out in northeastern Oregon, finding his way all the way down into northern California, and now being back up over in uh, outside of the, um, just, just east of, the, of I-5 in Oregon, down here, associated with the Rogue Pack. So, we live in Western Oregon, right? So far, there have been some significant human barriers towards the movement of the species into our area. Yeah, some might come eventually over the Cascade Range and we'll probably see some population moving up and down the Cascades, but look at where they're located down here, right? If I was a wolf, right? If I was OR7 or one of OR7's grandkids, I would be looking over here at the Siskiyous and going, man, that looks like great territory and not a whole lot of humans there, right? And I want, you know, el you know, elk and deer galore, you know, those, those, those docile things that move really slowly, eh, maybe in some of the places in the valley, but there's gonna be, you know, hunting galore for me how do I get there? Well, and we think, you know, I thought, you know, we know that highways are tremendous barriers to animal migration, right? There's actually been studies done on wolves on Canada One, right? And that's why if you drive Canada One now, they have the, the, the provincial governments and the uh, Canadian federal government have built these huge wildlife overpasses, right, to move so the species can migrate. Well. We might think about that with I-5 if we're thinking about places like Eugene and Salem. It's just a big ribbon, ribbon of concrete. But you get down here in the Medford and Grants Pass area, and I was just down there. I was, went down to do some forestry stuff on Monday and Tuesday uh, this week. And I was kind of looking, because I knew I was coming here, and I was going, well, okay, so where are they going to get across? And how many people here have been to Rogue River State Park? Right? right where the Rogue River crosses underneath I-5, right? Maybe you've camped there, but that's like the perfect wildlife corridor, you know? And, 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 and we have wolves in that area, and whether they've, maybe they've already gone there and we just don't know it, or Fish and Wildlife isn't telling us, right? But they can, they can get down in there, they can, go underneath, they can go underneath the freeway, and they're almost right into the Siskiyous. And what happens when they get to the Siskiyous? Then the coast range starts to come in. And here, I'm really interested to see what happens with human-wolf interactions at that point in time. Because when we're starting thinking about the coast range, you know, what's the dominant economic activity in the coast range? Logging, forestry, right? 
So how do wolves interact with forest landscapes? Pretty well, right? And industrial loggers, what do industrial lo or industrial foresters, you know, they're concerned about such things as black bear populations because they browse on the young trees. They're thinking about other things. They're thinking about deer populations and elk populations that browse on young trees and destroy, the, and destroy their crops. Suddenly, wolves are moving into this landscape. And maybe, in many cases, landowners might be thinking that the wolves are positive presence on this landscape. You know, we see a lot of arguments about wolves in, in northeastern Oregon where livestock industry is a big presence. I mean, we do have the dairy industry on the Oregon coast and others as well, but we also have a lot of industrial forest lands where certain types of ungent populations or bear populations are really a source of a tremendous economic loss. And so maybe as they, we see wolves move into this area and maybe come up, closer to Corvallis and places like Willamina, my back, you know, my hometown, well, it's not my hometown, but where I have forest land. Um, maybe we're gonna start seeing a different response. Right. And I'm really curious to see how that goes. Um, and with that, I think I'll just move us to questions. Thank you for inviting me, too. I just want to say that. You guys are a great audience. I love being here. You challenge me all the time. Um, hello, my name's Becky, and I have a question about hunting in Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming. Are wolves a trophy hunt? Because they're not food. Um, I think that's about the best way that you could categorize them, that they are a trophy hunt. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's a... Th it's a it's the thrill of the hunt. I mean, for the, for the for the human being, right? And yeah, it's, they might sell the pelt. Hi, this is Don. Um, a comment: uh, you could have included in that hundred and thirty thousand expenditure a couple of private plane rides for the Secretary of Interior on his honeymoon. But that leads to my that leads to my question. We're here for Ryan Zinke's year. Uh, you were here for Ryan's, uh, or you were here for, he's the Secretary of Interior, right? Steve. Yes, yeah, Steve Ellis. Okay. Uh, Steve was kind of pessimistic about federal policy that's going on, and just he went right down the line. And I could see this really impacting because, as you pointed out, the federal, the fe the federal is, is, is where the, uh, rubber hits the road and you have to follow federal policy. So do you have some of the concerns that, same concerns that Steve had? Oh yeah, I mean, I, I think as anyone who looks at natural resources and environmental policy, I mean, we're maybe in uncharted territories in some ways. And, uh, uh, you know, Ryan Zinke um, has been an individual who has expressed deep concerns over the nature and justice of the Endangered Species Act and its economic impacts. Um, so far, I think he's got his hands primarily busy uh, dealing with other things uh, that are more priority to the administration, whether it's you know the Antiquities Act and uh, wilderness areas and stuff like that. But you know, I, I expect that we'll see something more there. Uh, what we have seen is with regards to listing of, of species under the Endangered Species Act, that has um, ground to a halt, right? Um, so, yeah, I, 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 I understand those concerns. And, you know, I, I to me, I, I'm, I probably, in talking here, have been more optimistic than sometimes the way that you hear me speak. Um, I, I, I I take state policies very seriously because, I mean, states are kind of uh, engines of innovation. But, you know, we, there's a lot of pressure that comes from local communities within state policy. And, and biodiversity policy, whether we're talking about forestry or, or something like wolves, is really one of those examples. 
I mean, to me, I, I, I would much rather be a wolf, though, in Oregon than a wolf in, in Idaho, I can tell you that much. Um, and for a number of different reasons, uh, because we seem to be very concerned about the overall conservation of the species. I mean, the, the, the thing that I always come back to, though, with this is that, I mean, the Oregon approach here is one that is, at its heart, political. And that may not necessarily be a bad thing. I mean, I, I'm a political scientist. I don't see politics as being in inherently evil, right? I see, see it being as part of what we do as human beings, generally. But what we didn't start with, with wolf management in Oregon, is something that we often see happening with endangered species, is we start with such things as minimal viable population, right? How many of a species do you need? Uh, the question of you know interbreeding of wolves that kind of gets to this right we we and, and most biologists would not say that 112 wolves or 112 any of any species is enough to assume it's minimal viable population i would agree with them on that nevertheless they seem to be finding their way and if we give them room and if we can adapt to wolves on the landscape and in our communities they're gonna succeed here. And I find that encouraging. And you might say that in 2017, November of 2017, I'm looking for positive stories. So, yeah. Uh, hello, my name is Ken. Uh, when our famous OR7 started wandering south, I thought, well, the poor guy's headed the wrong direction. Um, <laughs> And then he finds a mate, and I've been told that female wolves don't wander. So does anybody know where she came from? Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, th this is one of the issues that we have when we only have about 9% of the population that's actually radio collared. Um, I think they do know, uh, because from, I, I think they do know where the, the, the mate came from, because even though they only radio collar a certain percentage, they go out and they uh, do, um, they trap and they take genetic material because they're tracing that flow of genetic material around. And so they do know where the mate came from, but they don't know when. And I, sh I, w I wish I had a better answer for you. Uh, the mate is younger than OR7 significantly, but has been putting out two or three I think two or three pups a year, generally, with survival of one or two. But, you know, and this, that's a big question, right? I mean, what are they? There could already be wolves across over here. We don't know. Yeah. Hello, I'm Bob again. Uh, the question I have, relates to something you haven't mentioned, but I'm kind of curious about. What is the difference in the position in the ecosystem of a, a coyote from a wolf? How, how do they um, compare or com contrast? Well, um, uh, the short answer is, is that coyotes don't like it when wolves come in because coyotes will lose and coyotes will be killed, right? Wolves will, uh, prey on coyotes. In fact, they oftentimes, there, there is um, evidence of them, uh, significant evidence of them, they go in and if they find coyotes, they just randomly kill them, right? Um, they're, they're trying to reduce the population of coyotes and they're also trying to send a message, right? So, um, and, and you know, and, and for, if you have ever dealt with coyotes, you know, they can be, problems in your chicken coops, right? And uh, if, if wolves come into your landscape, you'll probably have a lot fewer coyotes. Does that answer your question good enough? Okay. Yes, uh, this is Lynn. Um, I belong to the Greater Yellowstone Coalition it has active offices for many years in uh, Bozeman. You probably know about it. Mm -hmm. And um, I grew up in Anaconda, 
and um, the uh, copper mining industry went down the hill in the 80s and um, but uh, we've noticed that um, we've lived in Washington and Oregon for the last uh, 50 years so um, we've noticed and when we go back to our cabin outside of Anaconda that uh, there's uh, uh, much lower population in that area, Anaconda, Butte, and uh, Great Falls. And uh, the state has changed in um, its uh, political, uh, since we don't have unions uh, fighting for their rights in, uh, in the copper mining industry. And now the state has become more Republican than, than Democrat. I'm uh, just wondering, uh, you had that uh, map showing the population of, of, of uh, wolves in uh, both Montana, Idaho mainly, mm -hmm. and some Wyoming. I was amazed at uh, how many um, uh, wolves were in upper Montana there. Uh, the coalition fought uh, largely, was putting in uh, real money into um, uh, paying for and building uh, underpasses for the highways going up past uh, Missoula and, and up to uh, uh, past uh, Flathead Lake and uh, Glacier Park so that they could uh, allow uh, grizzlies from Yellowstone to uh, uh, go back and forth up to uh, Canada and uh, increase the population, but it also has to do with uh, wolves. Yeah. I was just wondering, how much uh, do you know about that, and uh, uh, has it uh, been of uh, help? Uh, one other thing, uh, uh, the, the guy that was married to Jane Fonda, I can't remember, I'm in mind block right now, Turner. He bought an enormous, twice, he bought enormous pieces of land just outside of Yellowstone in order to enhance uh, uh, especially uh, elk herds. Uh, what, uh, can you uh, amplify on that? I'm not, I'm not sure. I think you know more than I do on most of that. I mean, I know the, the coalition and then uh, particularly on the Canadian side, uh, the provincial and federal governments as well as some NGOs have kind of really worked on trying to find ways to improve wildlife corridors so that you have the the possibility of you know natural dispersal but you're also seeing that sort of exchange of genetic material that's really important for healthy species and I, I think those wildlife underpasses and wildlife overpasses are really important um, But I, I guess I would say when you look at wolves in the wake of 95 and 96, that even without the presence of those things, they seem to be doing pretty well, right? Now, I mean, wolves can do that maybe much easier than a bear in some cases, and certainly much easier than some species that are not nearly as mobile, right? Um, but um, you know, it certainly helps. Um, you know, and, and when we think back into Oregon, we have, we, we have a lot of barriers towards the movement of these species into new areas, whether we're talking about wolves, whether we're talking about western pond turtles, whether we're talking about Fender's blue butterfly. Um, you know, we, 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 we put up a lot of barriers uh, to the movement of these uh, species and their genetic material. Okay. I have a quick, quick sure. question. Uh, the um, Department of Fish and Wildlife, I have been uh, increasing the wild turkey population on the coast and the siskiyous are coming up. We've had some in our yard, actually. Uh -huh. uh, what would the wolves, are they able to fly up into a tree? How do they protect themselves? <laughs> uh, turkeys? Well, wild I, turkey. I, actually, I don't think the ODF&W is doing any of that 
now because the the turkeys seem to be doing it quite w quite quite well themselves but and I don't know enough about them but you know turkeys are are um, um, they're 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 very good at um, camouflage um, but they you know they they can fly right and so they do roost right so they can go up into trees okay I think it's about time but remember that there was a benign view of wolves in uh, Kipling's Jungle Book, where Mowgli was raised by wolves. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. so yes. thank you very much. Thank you.